Welcome back to Politics Tonight. And I still have with me the Executive Director of Yaga Africa, Mr. Samson Etodo, looking at Osho State Tribunal verdicts and electoral integrity in Nigeria. All right, Mr. Samson, the judges said both Oyetola and Adeleke benefited from the overvoting. Hence, they cancelled 181,540 votes cast in the 744 polling units across 10 local government areas of the state. So, how do we get rid of this in the coming 2023 elections? I think there are a few things that need to be done. First, political actors need to play this game by its rules. They need to comply with the rules. This act of encouraging voters to vote multiple times is unacceptable and it should be condemned. Secondly, the voters also need to check their behavior. Because why on earth, you know, should a voter aspire or even plan to vote more than once? I think it's criminal. And it doesn't say well about our, our, our moral values and ethics. And it has to be condemned. It's a negative political behavior that we must condemn. And people should not yield to this pressure from political politicians, this corruption by politicians, um, to get them to vote more than once um, um, in, in the course of elections. Because what it does is it undermines the integrity of the process. The third thing that we need to take out of this is the role that INEC also plays. And I think that INEC needs to ensure that it has strong oversight over the officials on the field. Because these officials sometimes can be compromised by politicians to alter figures. And when they do so, it leads to cancellation of elections. Because if we're not careful in 2023, we're going to see politicians compromise um, presiding officers. And rather than record the actual number on the beavers in the result sheets, they may alter the figures because once there is overvoting, because in some cases, it's not like there's actually overvoting, it's just computational errors. And once you once one figure or one figure is altered, even if you increase one. Right, it has the potential of leading to overvoting and cancellation. And you, we have to be careful so that politicians don't deploy these tactics in strongholds of their opponents. And this is where INEC needs to protect that, the process. The fourth is INEC needs to publish the number of accredited voters on the beavers on the highway. I tell you, if INEC has transmitted and published the total number of, pe of people who accredited, who were accredited in the Beavers on the election result green portal, then all these discussions that we're having wouldn't have even arisen in the first place. But because that process still requires some review, that has landed us here. And I hope that INEC takes this lesson from here, review the software on the Beavers. So that as soon as accreditation is concluded, the presiding officer can send the data and it is published on the, um, on the IREF. So that as a voter, when you go to the online portal for results, you can see what has been published on the IREF and from the beavers, as well as the manually entered you know, number of accredited voters on the results sheet. I think these are practical things that can be done that would enhance the integrity of the process. But Nigerians must also know that the beavers and the IRF are indeed a game changer. And don't let this ruling by the court or this attempt by some political stakeholders to undermine the beavers deceive us. Because there is a reason why politicians don't want the beavers and the IRF, because those tools limit election manipulation. And if you're going into an election where the stakes are so high, Politicians want to do everything possible to start convince this technology deployed by INEC, which for us as civil society and citizens, we have faith and we have trust that it can enhance the integrity of our electoral process. All right, then. I know you said uh, this judgment does not question the integrity of beavers, but then with this few complications here, here and there, how do we restore uh, the faith of many Nigerians in our electoral system? 
I think that's exactly what we're doing. We're having this conversation, particularly those of us who work on this issue, who understand this issue. We need to enlighten the public about the beavers, its function, and its limitations. Because sometimes people also think, and, and even in the public space, people um, think that the beavers is also used for electronic voting. I have heard, heard all sorts. The way the beavers works is that it is used for accreditation. And how do you get accredited? On the day of election, a voter comes in and their biometrics, their fingerprints and their facials, you know, is verified and, and that one day those voters are in the right polling unit and their name is on the register. And afterwards, they go to cast their vote. The process of going to cast your vote is still a manual process. The process of recording the results is still a manual process. The only process that is electronic is the accreditation process. That's the verification process that enables you get the ballot papers to cast your vote. And then the second bit is the electronic transmission of results. So results are still collated manually. And so this sort of manual collection also makes the process vulnerable to manipulation. So this is why INEC needs to deploy trusted, impartial officials to manage this process. The personal integrity of all these officials who are recruited by INEC is equally important. The second is the vigilance of citizens. I have said this over time, that for the presidential and the governorship elections and for all elections, do not allow any presiding officer issue you a ballot paper without accrediting you using the BVAS. The BVAS is provided to accredit you. And once you're not accredited using the BVAS, it means that the election for that polling unit will be canceled. And it means your vote will not count. So you have a duty to ensure that the BVAS is used for accreditation. If the BVAS malfunctions, and the law is very clear, that if the BVAS malfunctions, and by 2.30 p.m. on election day, INEC does not deploy a replacement BVAS, then that election for that particular polling unit will be suspended and it will continue the next day. So note that once the BVAS malfunctions, INEC is required to send a replacement BVAS before 2.30 p.m. on election day. And if by 2.30 p.m. no new BVAS is provided, the election will continue the next day. But the only reason why the election will continue the next day is if the total number of people who collected their PVCs in polling units where the BVAS malfunctions and it wasn't replaced, if the total number of people who collected their PVCs in those polling units exceed the margin of lead between two candidates. And this is where the margin of lead principles so, principle apply. But I want Nigerians to also know that the BVAS performed its function well in Osho. It was just at the point of, you know, the upload to the server. That is where you had this inconsistency. But even that inconsistency was also sort of rectified because first, one of the parties applied for the CTC of the report of accreditation before all the data was uploaded on the cloud. And after it was uploaded on the cloud, INEC issued an updated report. And this is conventional practice anyway. There's nothing untoward to, uh, uh, in this particular regard. But also, the public also needs to know that the tribunal requested for the VIVAS machines of, of, for all those polling units in question. And when they checked the VIVAS for all those polling units, it was consistent with the final report INEC issued. And so to that extent, I want the public to know that, yes, the BVAS is a technological device. It has its own challenges, but to a greater extent, the BVAS used by INEC for accreditation has the confidence of Nigerians, and we shouldn't let this particular um, matter, um, which for me does not question the integrity of the BVAS, give politicians a new way um, to attacking the credibility of the BVAS. Right. This is not the first time. When the smart card readers were introduced, we also saw something similar. So it's not new. Politicians fear technology, especially most politicians fear technology. 
And I say that, yes, this technology, it has its own challenges, no doubt, but all you need to do is to ensure defense mechanisms are in place to inspire, you know, confidence in members of the public. All right. In that regard, I would like to have your view about conduct of INEC officials during Oshu election, where personnel provided different reports of accredited voters. What stiffer measures can be taken, especially as the general elections draw nearer? No, I, like I just mentioned, I said the personal integrity of the INEC officials is equally important. And this is why voters, yes, trust the beavers, but also keep an eye on the INEC officials. Because these technology tools will not operate themselves. They need individuals to operate them. And where you have compromised um, election officials, they will can manipulate the system, you know, to subvert the will of the people. But I want to believe INEC has mechanisms in place to keep all this um, in check. And when you talk about, you know, the conduct of, of INEC officials, and this is where, you know, last week we, um, civil society issued uh, or released uh, um, a report on election manipulation risk index. And one of the concerns that we did express, you know, as part of the risk, you know, it's the recruitment of ad hoc officials, their credibility, their capacity is equally important for the integrity of the 2023 elections. And, it, and I want to call on both Nigerians and all stakeholders to keep an eye on the officials who will be manning the polling units uh, on the day of elections. Man, uh, uh, update yourself with information on the guidelines, know the procedure, so you can insist on compliance with the regulations and guidelines for the elections. Is going to take vigilance from every stakeholder, particularly citizens, to protect any form of manipulation. And I say this three things. One, when you show up on your polling unit on election day, verify that there is a BVAS machine in your polling unit. Once you verify there is a BVAS machine before accreditation, please ensure that on that BVAS, the number of accredited voters is zero. Ensure that the number of accredited voters is zero. And then afterwards, when accreditation is completed, ensure that you keep an eye that the presiding officer records the actual number of accredited voters using the BVAS on the result sheets to prevent any error. Where there is an error, insist that it is corrected. Let the presiding officer show the BVAS that these are the total number of accredited voters before recording it on the on the result sheets. And after that, keep an eye to ensure that they take a picture of that result sheet and upload on the INEC results very important. These are kinds of things that citizens need to do to protect the integrity of the electoral process. And don't leave it to the whims and caprices of presiding officers who are susceptible and vulnerable to compromise by desperate politicians. All right, so with this judgment and your robust analysis, will you say political actors, including electoral officials, are yet to have a deeper understanding of the 2022 Electoral Act? Absolutely. It's just clear that this, again, it's a new act. It's just one year um, down the line. Um, on the Actually, on, on election day, um, which is 25th of February, it will be exactly one year um, since the act was signed into law by the president. You recall the act was signed on the 25th of February, um, 2022 at 12.25 p.m. Um, so stakeholders are still trying to understand the law. Some aspects of the law are being tested. You can also see from the judiciary and from latest judgments electoral process. Because where judge deliver judgments that turns the law against its head, it's quite worrisome and distorted. And I think that judges need to study the electoral act. And I'm quite aware that there have been several trainings, you know, for judges of election petition tribunal. There's also a manual for judicial officers on the electoral act. And the law is very clear what happens in the course of overvoting. And it's about cancellation, and then elections will be declared inconclusive 
if the total number of people who collected their PUCs in affected polling units is higher than the margin um, of need. Uh, and so these are some of the issues. Politicians also need to understand you know, the processes, the entire value chain of the voting process and accreditation process. But you know, this is Nigeria. People, rather than understand the law to engage better, they understand the law to identify loopholes to exploit them. And this, again, speaks to the political culture within Nigeria. And I hope that our political actors will rise up both self and put the country first and also public interest in the course of this election. That complying by the, with the rules is important because it is beneficial to all. And for the judges, you know, who are turning the law over its head for whatever reason, they should know that they are damaging the reputation of the judiciary. That if citizens cannot trust that they would obtain justice, if stakeholders do not trust that they will obtain justice from the hallowed chambers, you know, of um, our judicial houses, then it just says a lot about this democracy that we practice. But everyone should be concerned about the kind of judgments issued by our judiciary. It is disturbing and it's, in, it's a huge threat, you know, to our democracy. And those who are benefiting, you know, from this uh, posture of the judiciary should also know that what goes around also comes around. The fact that it's you today does not mean tomorrow you're not also going to be a victim of these kinds of judgments that come from our thoughts that are not only questionable, but they are repugnant to natural justice as well as public interest. And this we must, and I call on the NJC as well as the Nigerian Bar Association, that we need to call out judges who are not complying and interpreting the law the way it ought to, but are doing so damaging the reputation of the judiciary. All right, uh, so let's talk about INEC preparation for the 2023 election. How would like you to rate, how do you rate it so far? Well, Yagi yeah, Africa published our pre-election observation report. And for the pre-election observation report, we deployed 822 long-time observers who are in the 774 local governments. So we are in every local government in Nigeria tracking INEX preparations, tracking the campaigns, tracking any one insights. We've released three reports, and the fourth report will be out sometime next week. And what have we found? That yes, INEC is conducting preparatory activities. And what are those three activities that we have observed? The collection of the issuers and collection of PVCs. There's also stakeholder engagement. There's also training of um, election officials. So to a large extent, you know, INEC is conducting, you know, its preparations for, um, the, for the general elections. We've also seen issues relating to redistribution of people to polling units. The voters register has been finalized and it's been issued to stakeholders. The BVAS machines have been tested. And on Saturday, the 4th of February, INEC will be conducting mock accreditation in, eight, in 460, 60, 486 polling units, 436 polling units across the country. So in each state, there are 12 polling units spread across three senatorial districts where INEC is conducting these mock elections. My major concern, our worry, is that the registered voters in those polling units may not be aware that there will be mock accreditation to come out on Saturday and test the river. And so on that part, the level of voter education has not been encouraged, and INEC needs to improve its voter education. The second issue that we also find is these attacks on INEC offices across some states um, and in a particular um, geographical region. And just today, INEC issued a statement you know, about the attack on its office in a um local government, where ballot boxes and other sense non-sensitive materials were destroyed. But in the statement, I let as assured the, the voters in those local governments that um, they, they, there will be replacement for those and then they can cast their vote. But you can just see a deliberate attempt to undermine INEC so it's unable to conduct elections in some places. And that is also very worrisome. And we hope that the federal government, as well as state governments and our security agencies, will nip this in the board 
to provide a safe and secure environment for people to cast their vote. The other issue relates with election logistics, where ballot papers and result sheets, we understand, you know, have been produced and they will soon be deployed across the states. Our expectation is that by 7 a.m. on the 25th of February, polling units will open and then voting, accreditation and voting will start by 8.30. Our expectation is that in 99.9% .9 of polling units, all they will open early um, in the, on, on, on February 25th. Uh, and INEC has given those uh, assurances, but with respect to their preparations, preparations are on, but then we have to also continue to keep an eye to ensure that all INEC has all the support that it requires to deliver uh, credible elections. All right, Mr. Samson, I would like you to help me analyze this. What are the revolutionary differences between the 2022 Electoral Act and that of 2011? Oh, there are significant um, you know, revolutionary provisions in the Act. The first one deals with the power of INEC to review declaration of results made under duress or in contravention of INEC rules and guidelines. And that's quite remarkable because previously in the 2010 Act, particularly, specifically the Section 68, you know, says that once declarations have been made by a returning officer or a coalition officer, only the tribunal can reverse that. And that has encouraged politicians to act to force INEC officials to declare them winners at mm -hmm. gunpoint. But now you can't even try that because the law already gives INEC the power to review declarations made under duress or where could returning officers, you know, contravene the regulations and guidelines. INEC shall within seven days withhold the results for that particular election or you withhold this issuance of certificate of return to a particular winner. But again, that INEX action is subject to judicial review. So if you're not comfortable you know, with INEX position, you can go to the court. I think that is revolutionary and that is going to be tested you know, in um, this particular election. The other revolutionary provision which we have seen is this issue around the time frame of elections. You can see that unlike the 2010 Electoral Act where um, can, can this submission of lists of candidates or campaigns actually start you know, um, 90 days to the date of election. We've seen early campaigns. We've seen early primaries. Um, there are several lessons that we have learned, you know, from this entire process. Um, but then it is revolutionary because for the first time, the primaries that were conducted in April, May. Previously, primaries start around August, um, actually around September, um, October. The other revolutionary provision is the one that redefines overvoting. Because in the 2010 Electoral Act, overvoting was determined based on the situation where the total number of votes cast, ex, um, the total number of votes cast is lower than the, is higher than the total number of registered voters. And that has changed now. And it's the total number of, in considering overvoting, you need to check whether the total number of votes cast exceeds the total number of accredited voters. The other one is on electronic accreditation, as well as electronic transmission of results. These are revolutionary provisions in the 2022 Electoral Act that were not in the 2010 Electoral Act. So now INEC can transmit results electronically. And we saw that in UTT. We saw that in Ocean, and that enhanced the transparency of the electoral process. Of course, in the 2010 Electoral Act, there were no limits, time limits imposed on when the federal government would issue or deliver uh, the funding for elections. But now it has improved the 2022 Act has enhanced INEX financial independence to the extent that the law is clear that one year before the election, INEX shall receive all its funding for the general elections. So these are some of the revolutionary, and I can go on and on, right. but this particular act is one of the best electoral legal framework that Nigeria has had since we return to democracy. And Nigerians should celebrate this act because they fought for it, they asked for it, they pushed for it, they advocated for it, and they mounted pressure on their legislators to deliver this act to them.
Interesting. All right, so Annika has expressed worry over impact of the ongoing fuel scarcity that could have on the conduct of the elections. In your view, how serious is this threat? It is very serious, and I see that's why IMEC is engaging with NNPC as well as the CBN. So one, elections are a human activity. Elections require huge logistics. The transportation of the ballot papers and the result fees from one point to another requires a vehicle, and in most cases, either motorbikes or in riverine areas, it requires boats. Because how would these materials get to those um, polling units? Let's keep in mind that the number of polling units we have is 176,000. 846 polling units. These polling units are spread across the entire length and breadth of this country in all the local governments. And some places are hard to reach. And so this transportation and the, the machines, as well as the cars that will be used you know, to transport these materials require fuel. Some of them even require diesel, right? If you have a shortage and the transporters don't have access to fuel, how are they going to transport these materials you know, to the polling units on election day? So we're going to have huge logistical problems. And if we're not careful, it might lead to delay you know, in, the con in the opening of polls. This is why you know, this is a threat. And I'm glad that INEC is already engaging the NNPC to work with the transport unions, as well as the uh, unions and, uh, that INEC is engaging for the transportation of the materials to make oil and gas available to them for the period of the elections. The second is, there are also transactions that INEC performs, you know, where it requires cash. And I hope that the CBN will make the cash also available to INEC because, for instance, at the community level, you know, where they pay these transporters, they need to pay for those services using um, using caps are not necessary um, transfer. And so those lower level sort of transactions, I think we need access to the access to capital, access to the new notes to be able to transact at that micro level. And when we think about this, let's think about what happens in, in the remotest of areas and how those transactions will be performed so that the transport unions don't use that as an excuse to delay you know, deployment of materials on election day, because this also has security implications. In a highly contested election of this nature, where the stakes are high, where you also have, you know, multidimensional insecurity and there's resentment in the land, you don't want to also heat up the quality and then engage in provocative actions that might snowball into something that we all may not be able to handle at the end of the day. So it's a huge concern but I'm glad to see that there are efforts to address this. And it's within our capacity as a country, you know, to address this particular threat. All right. Having said that, uh, Nigeria will be conducting national elections this month and in March. I'm curious to know how possible is it for you to deploy logistics for effective monitoring of the polls? Well, that's a very interesting question because we, everyone, who is involved in the election is also concerned about deployment. And I tell you, we have built our scenarios. We are still building our scenarios. Um, for the two general elections, we are deploying over 6,000 observers across the, across the country. And um, there are locations that we will definitely not cover because first, we will not um, you know, um, undermine the personal safety and security of, of citizens. Um, and so it's a big challenge for us. And, our expectation, and we continue to hope um, that this particular security situation in some cases will be addressed. But in some cases where it will not, we may not be able to deploy in those locations. And where we are unable to deploy or other organizations are unable to deploy, the big question is, can we trust the figures that come from those locations? That's one. Mm -hmm. Two, are there places, how do we ensure that insecurity is not used as an alibi to compromise or rig this entire process. Because what we've seen, uh, and in different clients, and not just Nigeria, is there are times where, you know, under the guise of insecurity, elections may be manipulated or elections may not even hold, but results will be produced from certain locations. 
We hope that that doesn't happen. And this is why I think the Interagency Committee on Electoral Security, INEC, needs to engage stakeholders and share information about where are the locations where elections cannot hold due to insecurity or due to other um, sort of environmental disasters um, that makes it um, difficult to conduct elections. And once we identify those locations, what will be the fate of the Nigerians in those locations um, where INEC is unable to deploy? Because we cannot disenfranchise those people. We cannot deprive them and deny them of their right uh, to vote because it's a constitutionally guaranteed right. And nobody should be excluded or prevented from voting on the basis of an insecurity that they never contributed to. All right, let's talk about vote buying, which you would agree still remains a huge factor in our elections. What can be done or what do you think can be done to read our elections of financial inducements? I think that there are, there are three there are different dimensions to this. Uh, and the yes. first one is Nigeria needs a comprehensive political financing reforms. And these are conversations that we will have, you know, after the elections, that you know, this entire obscene commercialization of the electoral process needs needs to be stopped up. We could impure our democracy. The second is the state and government needs to perform its responsibility of delivering the promise of democracy to the people. This weaponization of poverty that you see exemplified you know, in the, through vote buying is just, is just unacceptable. And so we must, as a country, come to a point where we have to call leaders to account for their promises. The third dimension, INEC has reconfigured the polling units. These are, you know, solutions that can help the entire process. But INEC has also said that despite reconfiguring the polling units to protect the secrecy of the ballot, politicians have also devised other means of vote buying. Because we often focus on what happened on the day of election, but we forget that voter inducement actually starts way before the election. And so if you focus on election day vote buying, what is the EFCC and the ICDT doing with respect to prosecuting people who have been arrested or vote buying, even in the Australian election. We saw the fantastic state of record undertaken by EFCC officials in the Australian election. Where are those people who were arrested? What is the level of their prosecution? Because until that, until you, you share that information with the public and also stakeholders, you will not deter this act and behavior by politicians. And I think that some of the steps that the federal government has also taken, it's also geared towards limiting, you know, vote buying on, um, on the day of elections. But my last comment on this rests with the Nigerian voter. That despite, I agree with the argument that poverty is one of the reasons why people sell their votes. But mm. the continuous sale of your vote makes you poorer, and poorer and poorer. It doesn't in any way solve your economic um, deficiency because the politicians know why they are buying your votes because your vote is important. Why won't you push back and resist you know, this, this fail of your vote and vote for leaders that you are confident can provide you with long-term dividends of democracy? And my call on Nigerian citizens is don't sell your vote because it limits you and then it restricts you from speaking afterwards. Oh, because right. you sell your bet and you sell your vote. Because the politicians will have no respect and no regard for you when you get into office. Because after all, they bought their way into office. So why should they respect you? Why should they consult you? Why should they address your priority needs after they have bought you know, the, your vote on the day of election? So please resist the sale of votes because there are people who we saw in Oshun and in Anambra elections who said no, they are not going to sell their votes and they insisted. All right, Mr. Those Samson. Uh, all right, just before we go, let me know, what are your fears concerning this election? The fears for this election are one, that the politicians are so desperate that they want to interfere with IMEX operations 
in a way that it undermines the integrity of the process. And that, for me, is the greatest fear. Because the political class just believes that you cannot win elections without any strategy of manipulation. And that is not true. Because there are people who have won elections without manipulating the process. Because if you think about the innovations that have been introduced, I worry that this desperation will push politicians to do unimaginable things just because they want to perpetrate themselves in office or force themselves you know, on the people. Please give the Nigerian people the opportunity to decide for themselves on who they feel should lead them from the state houses of assembly down to the president. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much. He's the executive director of Yaga Africa, Mr. Samson Itodo, and we looked into Oshun State Tribunal verdict and electoral integrity in Nigeria. You've made very valid points this, this night, and I must thank you for your robust analysis. Thank you very much for coming on Politics Tonight. Thanks for having me.